our biggest competitor back then was a company called, uh, well, it was a product called Bugzilla, which was mm. made by Apache and it was an open source product out there. And the word Bugzilla came from Godzilla, uh, yeah. which was the sort of Japanese uh, film. And But it turns out that actually Godzilla was the, uh, you know, Anglis- anglicized uh, Western name, uh, Gojira is actually Gojira. the uh, Japanese yeah. name, Gojira. And yeah. uh, so we dropped the Go and Ajira became, you know, the product. And back then you could buy four letter domain names, you know, just on your credit card yeah. without any problems. And yeah, maybe I should have given, not, not, not started a software company and just it's bought up four letter domain names. It would have been more, more <laughs> profitable. For sure. But we bought, yeah, bought Jira.com and, uh, you know, we started building the product. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com slash twist for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Supergut is the only nutrition brand clinically proven to improve digestion, balance blood sugar, sustain energy, and manage weight. Save 25% on their delicious shakes, bars, and prebiotic mix at supergut.com with code TWIST. And... Miro helps take ideas from in your head to out there in the world with his ability to democratize collaboration and input. Sign up for free at Miro.com slash startups. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. Some companies are just so influential. They they define a category or a region. And Atlassian really became the anchor, the foundation of the Australian startup industry. A lot of the great startups our alumni of Atlassian. And if you're in the tech space, you know the firm. Today, we're joined by the co-CEO and co-founder, Scott Farquhar, on the program. How are you, sir? Great. What year is this for Atlassian? You're you're obviously in the second decade. I'm not sure what year it is, though. This is is, uh, year 21 or 22, depending on where you count the starting point. So uh, it's been a while now. We've we've been around the block a, a, a few times. Yeah, so technically entering your third decade well done and the crazy thing about your startup was it was largely bootstrap right like just two small rounds of funding if i remember correctly and then they came in years eight nine or ten or something yeah we never took primary capital onto the balance sheet so like we did some secondary rounds to allow mike and i to take some money off the table and allow employees to take some money off the table but uh we've never taken primary money and then we ipo'd in 2015 and so uh, we originally took cash in 2010 from Excel because we wanted to head towards going public. Yeah. And uh, some interesting stories and going to that. And then in 2014, we did that sort of pre-public round that uh, sort of popularized a bit these days from a uh, public market investor to help us get across to being public. Yeah, to your real price, right? If I have here in my notes. So yeah. you, this is incredible to to build a company from inception to IPO without outside capital. I mean, that's really what I'd love to talk to you about. So how did the company start? What was the first product? And how do you build a company with essentially no venture capital, uh, no seed funding? People right now in the United States, uh, man, it's the entitlement level was really high for about five years there, uh, where people wouldn't even start working unless somebody gave them 3 million bucks. They say, how do I do it? You know, and uh, so let's get into it. It's perfect topic for, you know, 2023 when let's face it, the, the, the seed funding is really dried up. Uh, continued funding also dried up. It's pretty dark out there for startups. So how did you do it? What was the first product? We started in sort of 2001 each time. And back then it was really like the dot-com crash. Like, and we think, you know, 2008, 2009, and, you know, kind of the current downturn is bad for for technology. And and it is, but nothing really compares to the dot-com crash where most companies lost 90% 90% of their market capitalization, people laid off in, in huge, huge numbers. And uh, back then, we you know we thought it was the right time to start a company, um, probably because we were graduating out of college. We had no other choices. It was either that get, or that'll go work for a bank. And so uh, we, we decided we didn't want to have to wear a suit and go to work. We knew the, the graduate salary to work at PwC was $48,500, and we figured as long as we could earn more than that and not like have to wear a suit to work, we would be good. And so we didn't really have huge, um, you know, venture capital style ambitions uh, at the start of our, our company. And I think the advantage back then was that 
um, you know, while we couldn't get any money, uh, none of our competitors or no one else in the industry could get money either. And so, yeah, it was a level playing actually, field there. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Bootstrapping was an, a, a viable uh, alternative. And, uh, and we also, I think there were some technology transitions going on at that time. And, uh, you know, we, we built our products on open source software, which meant we could catch up to many of the competitors that were, you know, had out there, been out there. We, uh, the browser was coming around. And so many of our competitors at the time had built client server products and, uh, they all built a browser, you know, add on as an extra thing, which meant they just had to support two different versions. And so we could catch up while they were building two versions of every feature. We could build it once. And so we bet on a new technology. And also then, you know, the internet distribution had come around and it's a long, you know, way from there to now Stripe where you can just write a lot of code and take credit cards. But we were sort of the very early days where you could, you know, conduct commerce online. And so instead of having to sell software for 50 or $100,000, which you sort of had to do when you were, you know, doing it on a golf course and with credit cards and faxes and purchase orders, like we could sell software for $5,000. Um, and so we had these huge advantages in a time that we could catch up with our competitors. And, uh, you know, being in Australia, I guess we didn't uh, really know any different. I guess if we'd been in Silicon Valley, everyone would have told us that was impossible. Um, in fact, many Australian venture capitalists told us it was really impossible to build a business that way. Um, but it is a time and place that worked out for us. And you were builder founders, you were doing consulting gigs on the side, uh, high pay price consulting gigs, right? You paid a couple hundred bucks an hour. And then at night, you're building Jira. Uh, and, and that is really the heart of bootstrapping. Almost every bootstrapping story I hear starts with people doing some kind of consulting work, they got an ad agency, they got a dev shop. And then they see some opportunity to build a product. And they go from building the product, you know, 20 hours a week and doing consulting 40 or 50 hours a week. And then the numbers just slowly switch to the point at which you just start telling customers, listen, I, I can't do any consulting for you anymore because we got this other product that we built. Is, is that what happened over a couple of years? Yeah, it's was, it was two bits of consulting. One is we started a support firm for a, a, it was a company built out of Sweden called Iron Flare and they had a product called Orion Server, which was back in the application server days where there was like 50 different application servers, you know, vying for uh, supremacy on the internet. And uh, so we provide support for this small Swedish company who had most of their customers in America. And that was a terrible, terrible business. In fact, I'm glad it was so bad because many, I know many founders, you know, great founders get trapped in mediocre businesses. This was so bad. Uh, we had to get up at, you know, four in the morning or three in the morning when the phone rang to answer someone from the US, uh, you know, and, uh, and try and sound credible at three in the morning trying to solve support calls. And so we did that for a while. Then we discovered writing software is actually our passion, not, you know, supporting someone else's software out there. And we started building that. But in order to bootstrap, we still needed money. So uh, some of the people who had paid for consulting uh, or paid for the support chose to fly me across to the Netherlands uh, to work and do some code review over there. And so I flew across for a couple of weeks and eventually a couple of months. And uh, I would work during the day in, in the Netherlands on uh, what was a, a billing system for the Dutch telecommunications uh, company. And uh, I'd do a good job over there. And uh, I'd read up textbooks at night on how to code. And uh, then the rest of the time, I'd be coding on Jira, which is our, our first product. Yeah, I mean, that's bootstrapping at its best, doing whatever it takes to keep the lights on, pay the bills, and then diverting, uh, you know, the extra hours you have to building that product. And so how did you come up with the idea for, for Jira? What's the origin story there? We found uh, back then, um, in building our own software, like on doing the support work, we realized there was nothing to track all the tasks that we needed to get done. And we built something sort of really crappily internally just because there was a need for it. And then we realized and went out to the market to sort of see, well, what else is there out there? And there was nothing. There was either open source and the open source stuff was really terrible and it would take you literally a week to set up. You know, the first stage was compile my SQL with these special flags. And, you know, that's not really easy for, for most people to do. And uh, all you had very expensive stuff that started at $100,000, you know, going up from there and, you know, sold by IBM. And in many cases, the software was consulting where, you know, they'd come in and that was their introduction to your company rather than a product you would, you would buy. And so we really felt that there was something in the middle that you could put on your credit card and, mm. uh, and do that. And, uh, our biggest competitor back then was a company called, uh, well, it was a product called Bugzilla, 
which was mm. made by Apache and it was an open source product out there. And the word Bugzilla came from Godzilla, uh, yeah. which was the sort of Japanese uh, film. And But it turns out that actually Godzilla was the, uh, you know, Anglis- anglicized uh, Western name. Uh, Gojira is actually Gojira. the uh, Japanese yeah. name, Gojira. And yeah. uh, so we dropped the Go and Ajira became, you know, the product. And back then you could buy four-letter domain names, you know, just on your credit card yeah. without any problems. And uh, yeah, maybe I should have given not 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 started a software company and just it bought up four letter domain names it would have been more more <laughs> profitable. <laughs> For sure. But we bought yeah, bought Jira.com and uh, you know, we started building the product. Uh, amazing. And and it was open source to start. Uh, you're doing bug tracking, project management, all, all that simple stuff. But people had solutions for this in the market. It was just generally client server software, or that was what you were up against, proprietary IBM software, Microsoft software, et cetera? Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things here. One is there's a company called Rational, and I think it still exists somewhere. I don't know who they've been sold to these days. But uh, when we started, Rational had about 1,000 customers worldwide. And you know those customers probably on average t- you know, s- spent a, a million dollars with Rational um, you know, between software and services and so forth and keeping it up. And when you're spending a million dollars with uh, on software, that really restricts it down to a very small number of customers that can afford to do that. Mm. And I think a decade later, when I stopped tracking it, Rational still had about a thousand customers. Yeah. And uh, so our original goal was to be very different. We had our big, our first big audacious goal was to get to fifty thousand customers uh, worldwide, and it took us about twelve years to do that. Uh, and we set that goal when we had five hundred. So our big hairy audacious goal for the company was a hundred times our current size, but more importantly, it was in a sort of a, a vector that really made us differentiated from everyone else in the market because we were really going to go after high volume, low cost at scale and sell globally. And so that really put the tenants like if we're going to sell globally, you have to basically sell through your website. If you sell through the website, it has to be on a credit card. If it's on a credit card. You know, it needs to be able to sell itself because, it, you know, um, and it needs to be good enough that you can sort of try it out and then buy it. So I sort of had this virtuous cycle that we probably now known as pro- product-led growth um, was sort of the, didn't have a name back then, but we were probably the one of the earliest pioneers of people being able to try and buy business software on the internet. If your landing page is terrible, I'm out, right? Most consumers are. It's 2023. You can't have an ugly website. Stop selling for okay or good and have great, and great means you're using Squarespace. It's out of the box, beautiful. These websites have templates made by the world's greatest designers that are gonna engage your audience, let you sell anything. And Squarespace, over the past decade, has just added feature after feature on top of the gorgeous templates that are designed for mobile, and the drag and drop web design with their Fluid Engine is just perfect, easy to use, and you get built-in analytics, marketing channel analysis, sales data, all that stuff. Not, you know, it goes beyond page views and site visits and time and all that. And with Squarespace, you can create an online store or you can start a blog. Click of a button, right? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. You can create a subscription business for members-only content. You're seeing a lot of that out there. It's simple. It's cost-effective. It's gorgeous, and they keep adding feature after feature after feature. That's when technology is at its best, isn't it? When you pay one price, but the product gets better and better and better. You get that with your Tesla. You get that with your iPhone. You get that with Squarespace. These are the legendary brands of the internet of this era. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, I want you to go to squarespace.com slash twist. And they're going to give you 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Go to squarespace.com slash twist because they know we sent you. The other thing people don't realize is you created Slack before Slack existed. People were using IRC, I guess, to do, you know, like some general team chat. Really hard to set up an IRC server. It's, it's meant for developers. It's, you know, core infrastructure of the internet before the web, IRC. But you created HipChat, and uh, that was just a side project. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, obviously, you wound up selling it, I think, ultimately to Slack. But talk about that side project and, and what you got right there and maybe what you missed in terms of the opportunity to build something really big. Uh, totally. Uh, so we, we, uh, there's a company called HipChat that we were using internally. And, you know, we were early on the internet. Um, I sort of feel like if we didn't build Jira, we would have built a dozen other products that we needed, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, to build a software company on the internet. We built our own, you know, billing system and we built our own, you know, effectively version of HubSpot internally. So we, when you're, I guess, early in these trends, you get to see a lot of, you know, kind of the new ways of doing things. And one of the things we felt was we used IRC internally for a long time. We used um, a whole bunch of other, you know, um, uh, tools out there. And then eventually we set it on HipChat, which was great because it was all in one and our developers loved it. And so did everyone else in the organization. So it was sort of the first development tool 
where developers loved it and everyone else loved it. And we, we, we acquired them. When we acquired them, I think there were about six developers and uh, they had a quirky personality, you know, as a, as a brand, as a company. And uh, we, you know, doubled or tripled that, that team. And uh, it was growing really fast. I think it was growing three to 400% year on year, which for most software companies, you would say is like, that's, that's a home run. Like, you know, that's incredible. Uh, and, uh, but what eventually happened was Slack, uh, you know, spun out of a games company that, uh, you know, went south uh, with Stuart, Stuart Second, the games company that went south, the first created Flickr, the, the second created Slack. Um, and so they came out with a ready-made product and, you know, Stuart was very good at uh, branding and PR and so forth. And, uh, and so they, you know, ended up growing a thousand percent year on year or, or more. And so it showed there was this huge category there. Uh, and, you know, and eventually, you know, they, we felt that between when Microsoft Teams entered the market, there was, uh, you know, two players, you know, between Slack and Microsoft. And we didn't think that it would support, you know, a third player in the market. Even though um, we we knew we had a better product, I've used you know Slack since, and I, you know we used our product, and I would still maintain we had a better product, but the market dynamics weren't going to allow three. And so my lesson for that particular thing, like you know when people ask me what did you learn, what would you teach yourself or other entrepreneurs, uh, a couple ones. Um, one is if you're early to a market, you need to bet heavily on that market, you know, and uh, you know we. We bet we, you know, doubled and tripled the team size, uh, you know, in, in line with its its growth, but we uh, uh, we didn't bet heavily enough in, in that in that market. We should have, you know, taken out banner ads and we should have uh, really pushed that. Uh, the second one uh, for me is um, that uh, in, in an engineering sense, uh, when you have a small engineering team, you know, t- sub ten people. The way that they operate as an engineering team is is very very efficient because you don't need to create documentation. Everyone knows where everything is. It's like a really small team. When you double that team to twenty or twenty five people, you actually go backwards in productivity. You you actually go you know and and you really need to triple or quadruple the team to actually get forward momentum. And so though we doubled the team, we went backwards in productivity because you had to create all the documentation and the way the teams interacted and so forth and. Uh, so we should have really, you know, put a lot more effort behind uh, that that engineering team. Um, and uh, the last one is big markets can be way bigger than you think. And even if you've got the numbers at your back uh, in terms of raw growth, uh, you should always look at it in terms of like what what does that compare to the market size and what does that compare to your competitors? And they were, were you know, growing at stratospheric rates. Um, you know, we could have grown faster if we pushed. I mean, this is the amazing lesson of entrepreneurship. Even if something's growing three or four times year over year, three or four hundred percent growth, you you really need to test to see if it should be ten x growth, um, and not accept that it's three or four x. And you have to be even more ambitious. But sometimes, you know, especially you guys were, you know, uh, first time entrepreneurs now acquiring companies, you you, you have to invest more. And then the paradox of investing, I love your second point, which is, hey, you had a bunch of people that actually creates all this overhead, it slows people down. And now it has to move from a 10 person little SWAT team, a little Navy SEAL team, a perfect Olympic team, to now it's got to be an organization. And, and that's painful and requires infrastructure. And I suppose, you know, the other parts of the business, like Jira are also growing incredibly well. So now you've got to pick which of these projects to focus on and and that also as first time founders doing this you know running a house of brands is hard you need to have leadership in each one huh agreed uh, the the trade off between different uh, you know capital investments is is hard and the interesting one for us is we were always profitable so we actually had the cash ability to do that uh, mm-hmm. it was constrained by the ability to find people and probably a little bit our risk uh, tolerance and uh that's interesting. As a bootstrapper, there's a lot of advantages in that uh, you know you're in control of your own destiny, um, but you know you have a history of measured res- you know kind of in- investment and seeing the return and putting more investment in over time. And I think that you know you've got to move to a VC model when you've got this huge opportunity that you know does have potential entrance uh, and and move a lot faster. And I think we've learned that now when we looked at you know entering new products and new markets these days. We're much more aggressive um, with uh, with putting the investments behind these uh, the new markets we go into. So tell me now that you got this new playbook and the go fast um, and really take the opportunity. What, what's the what's the aggressive playbook? What's in that one as opposed to the bootstrapping playbook? And, and how have you evolved that? Yeah, so we've uh, 
You know, if, the two original bootstrapping ones would probably say Jira and Confluence were our original bootstrapped uh, products and, and both came from just listening to market needs where a customer had, you know, come to us and we, we, we looked and said, you know, we need this ourselves internally. And if we'll get more recent products, so, so Atlas and Compass, they still form that same playbook, which is we internally have needed something and we've gone out to the market and seen what's out there. And more and more what we find is that we find products that companies like Facebook and Google, uh, you know, have internal products that do these things, um, but there's no product out in the market. And so we feel like, well, we, we need to build it internally or we can build it for ourselves and customers. And that's what we've done really well over, over the years. And so now we, you know, build products internally for ourselves and we invest a lot more behind them. Like we'll put, you know, 50 to 100 person teams on them, not to start with, because I think that's always a ramp period where you want a really small dozen people uh, that build the core of any product. I think that's the way to build any new go to market. But as soon as we start seeing traction in the market, we ramp up so that we can, you know, continue delivering features and make noise out there on these products. Okay, so I want to get to two things. One, how you market them and scale them. But before that, how do you know you actually have product market fit? I got that piece in there that you slid in there about how you find products. If Facebook or Tesla or somebody, you know, a video game company like like Stewart's uh, old video game company builds some internal product to make everybody more efficient. Well, of course, the long tail of companies, the quarter million companies that you service, half million companies service, whatever it is now, they're going to need it, right? Um, and they they don't have the ability to put 10 developers on it and build an internal thing. Some brilliant insight. How do you know you have product market fit? Once you do have product market fit, how do you scale? What, what are the things that actually work with product led growth and products for developers and business teams? I think product market growth hits you in the face when you have it. And if you're ever worried that you don't have it, it's probably true, is my experience. And if I go back to Atlassian's revenue numbers, and I'll be off a bit on this, this is not SEC approved sort of numbers, but like from my memory, like our first year, first full year of, uh, you know, selling Jira uh, was about $300,000 worth of revenue. The next year was 1.2 million. The year after that was four. The year after that was 12. We then had 21, 35, 42, and that was when the global financial crisis hit. We sort of only went up 20% that year. Uh, then we went to 56, 75, and I think about 110. And so Amazing. in each of those, you know, when you go from 4 million to 12 million in revenue and you've got a dozen people working for you, life, life is pretty good and you're really just yep. trying to hold on. And I feel like that's when you've got product market fit. You really have that sort of near vertical growth. And I've advised a whole bunch of uh, startup founders who think they have a great product, but they get trapped in these terrible businesses that grow at you know 15% year on year on a couple of million dollars worth of, of, of revenue and they're never going to be a hit. And uh, in fact, a good friend of mine uh, runs a company called uh, Culture Amp. And uh, they do employee surveys and they're, you know, very, very big company these days. But he was also someone I advised. He had, they did a different product early on and it just wasn't going anywhere. And, uh, you know, I advised him that product market fit really does feel, you know, when you've got it. So yeah. uh, we, we did that um, with, you know, Jira and Confluence and, you know, and uh, so these days, you know, I guess we've got a good playbook about what that, what that looks like. And we keep trying, uh, you know, until we've got that. And then on the growth side of things, it's interesting. Many enterprise businesses have a sales-driven motion. If you look at many of our peers, it will be, what's my revenue going to be? Well, that's really just the number of salespeople I've got times the quota that we put in them, times the attainment ratios, times our rent period. Like That is the way that they predict uh, you know, revenue. And look, at scale for enterprises, that's a, that's a reasonable way to do it. But if you want to build a product-led growth company, it's much more like a consumer model it's basically how many trials do I get? How many people are using the product? At what stage in the, the funnel are they? Um, and that's much more scalable at that stage. Uh, you know, you're not throwing salespeople at it to get every incremental uh, dollar of revenue. And, uh, you know, so, so we focus on, on metrics like how many active instances are there of our product out there, whether they're paying us or not, just how many people are using it. We focus on consumer metrics like monthly active users which is a big metric we use internally. So we're sort of much more consumer focused in the metrics we use. Does that mean you still don't have famously uh, a sales team and you're still not doing like the SaaS model? Let's get a bunch of salespeople here. You're still 
committed to, hey, the product-led growth model, or did you ever add salespeople? I remember in the early days, you didn't have salespeople. Yeah, we uh, for a long time, we had the sort of no sales mentality. We like uh, Salesforce is no software mentality. It's a great tagline. Uh, you know, a lot of journalists want to write about it. And uh, I would say, you know, of... Of the 250 plus 260,000 plus customers we have today, you know, of 260,000, 250,000 don't have any person that touches them in terms of sales. So we're still largely product led growth for everything that we do. What we found though is as you get successful inside large companies, they then want to standardize on you, uh, particularly in the last year or so when people are trying to save costs, they want to standardize on you. And so they want to call someone up to have that conversation. And we found that having a more traditional sort of, you know, sales in, um, motion in those customers makes a lot of sense. And uh, what we did with those people is we have incredibly high quotas because these salespeople are not out there prospecting for customers, trying to call people up, uh, you know, looking at LinkedIn, trying to find a new prospect. It is really an existing customer that wants to talk to someone ah. about how to use more of our products. And uh, so I think that's the way of sales of the future is that, I, you know, if you're trying to get a new customer by calling them up on the phone, I think that's a really difficult motion, very expensive. You're ending up in head-to-head -head, uh, motions. And uh, whereas if you start bottoms up, start with a team and a team's successful and then you get to another team, the enterprise process at the end to do a consolidation or get them to use a second or third product is a way different conversation that you're having. And particularly at our price points, uh, we're subbing out a lot of competitors uh, you know, there are much higher price points, but we have the credibility because they're already in there. And I think that's the that's eventually the model that, you know, I think most enterprise software companies should do unless unless you're, you know, work day and you sell one copy inside inside your entire system. Yeah. If you're any sort of collaboration product, whether it's us or Slack or anything like that, bottoms up um, with a motion at the top to help people consolidate is the way that it's going to go. Um, now, I do see some people make mistakes here and... Uh, there are many companies that started like that and what they discover is that well, when we add salespeople, uh, we get great results. So we keep adding salespeople at every stage of the funnel and eventually you get to the stage where every person gets touched by a salesperson and it's death by a thousand cuts and it makes sense on an ROI basis at every stage. But then eventually your website you know, has contact us for a price and talk to a salesperson and you don't invest in the onboarding experience. And over time, I think that ends up being an issue. Um, so we are very clear about who uh, gets touched by a salesperson and who doesn't. Yeah, you. I mean, the total number of customers across all the products, approximately. I, I had read somewhere you broke a quarter million. Yeah, we have two hundred sixty two hundred sixty thousand customers around the world, and I think wow. that's like pretty much every country and territory we can we can sell to. That's wild. You've heard me talk about Supercut a bunch. This has been a key part of my health journey. It's an awesome nutrition company that my bestie, David Friedberg from the All In Podcast started. I love their bars. I love their shakes, especially the gut balancing chocolate brownie bar. It is delicious. They also have an unflavored prebiotic mix you can add to anything. I like to put it in my coffee. You can put it in your oatmeal. Their products are super helpful for weight loss. Why? Well, Super Guts products mimic the effects of Ozempic by boosting your GLP-1 hormone. This helps quell hunger and boost your metabolism, which is a great, great combination, obviously. And Super Guts prebiotic fiber, that actually uh, alleviates digestive issues. And obviously, the products all taste great. The best part, the team at Super Gut actually put the work in and scientifically proved their products work. They conducted a placebo-controlled clinical trial with Stanford last year. That's been published in the medical journal Diabetes, Obesity, and Metabolism. The results were amazing. The participants in this study, they lost weight, they lowered their blood sugar, they improved their metabolic health, and they had improved digestion and so much more. Whether you want to improve your gut health, maybe drop a few pounds like I did, or just feel better throughout the day, and listen, you're busy, you're traveling, I like to bring Supergut with me, go to supergut.com and use the code TWIST, you get 25% off. Go to supergut.com and use the code TWIST to get 25% off. I've been on this health journey, I've lost 40 pounds, a big part of that, sincerely, was me using Supergut. So, go to Supergut com and use the code twist for 25 percent off they just had darmesh from hubspot on and you know they committed to the mid-size the small enterprise and they had to have the same discipline which is the product had to be exceptional the you know and the product had to sell itself and uh sure yeah if you're big enough we could have a consultative sale later but it, there's something about having to please a two-person or a 20-person organization that just makes you really efficient and sharp on products huh 
I think so. Uh, Dunnish is a great friend of mine, an incredible technologist, and uh, also hats off to him for you know wanting to be the sort of technical person and not be the CEO. Like I think it's many, it's very difficult for people often to make that, but he realizes exactly what he's great at, which is building products and he's deep rolling his arms up in the AI side of things as well. And uh, I think HubSpot, um, we, we, one of our employees is a board member over there and, and they've learned a lot from our product-led growth uh, model. And uh, mm-hmm. they're very similar, uh, which is, yes, we can have a great product that sells itself. If you need to talk to us eventually at scale, we're, we're here, but like we win because of a great product that sells itself. And I think that's really hard to disrupt uh, mm. Whereas there are many enterprise companies that you know are there because they've got a great sales team, but you can you can sell you know uh, I presume Salesforce is, is HubSpot's large competitor. You know there can be pockets of HubSpot you know in a Salesforce deployment. It's unlikely to be the reverse because of the way that the sales motion happens. That's fascinating. Yeah, I mean it's it's just like hand to hand combat, like a much more guerrilla style. In a way, the product led growth teams like the ones at HubSpot, the ones at Atlassian, they're doing this like street level, winning over the actual customer who uses the product every day. And then you you look at like the Oracles or Salesforce, you know, they might be doing like the, you know, going to the Warriors game or taking people out to dinner and using the sales and the CTO top down sales. And and it's going to result in something very different, as you're saying. Darmesh is obsessed with AI. Are you obsessed with it now too? And what impact is it having in the organization here as we move into this year one of chat GPT language models and, you know, an actual uh, platform starting to emerge that can be used by, you know, any business user can just use any number of these uh, language models themselves. And you get hugging face throwing up new changes every day. It's got to be in your consciousness, huh? Yeah, the anchor AI in, in the way I think about it, in technology, because it's so much of a winner takes all market, it usually takes some sort of technology shift to shuffle the playing board. And in those technology shifts, you find some companies that endure, you know, across multiple of them and some that stumble. And if you look back historically, you know, back to at least my lifetime, uh, you had this sort of move to desktop software, which obviously, you know, Microsoft and, and Windows and Office were, you know, kind of the big beneficiaries of that. And then you had, you know, the sort of turn of, 2000, you know, 1999, 2000, where you had the internet came along and you'd say, you know, Netscape, Netscape was, uh, you know, the big winner there and Microsoft played, played catch up, but it, it birthed, you know, companies like Google um, that, that wouldn't have existed uh, previously. And then you sort of roll through to, to mobile and, uh, you know, that birthed Apple really as a, as a company. And, uh, you know, uh, in Google, you know, put sort of with Android did, it, did a good job there, but Microsoft wasn't anywhere really to be seen. Then cloud came along, which is not so much a, a consumer uh, product, but Microsoft, you know, caught up heavily with cloud and suddenly Amazon's, you know, in, in, in the race as well. And so you see these technology shifts where a couple of the big players maybe make the shift and a couple of players don't make the shift. And I think AI is the next big technology shift that's going to shuffle the playing board of technology. And uh, when I look at, you know, I've gone deep with all the different large language models and how, it, and how they all work. Um, in some ways, the industry has been saved by large language models because if you weren't deep in AI, you can basically rent a large language model for some, from someone, which is very different, I think, to how most people thought this world would play out. And so there are a lot of companies who are really just playing, you know, catch up effectively by by renting these large language models who didn't have investment. So it really is different than than most pundits would play thought it would. I think the real value is going to come from putting data together with these uh, models uh, because the large language models at the moment, I view them a bit like a Swiss Army knife. They're expensive. They're not particularly good at any individual thing, but they do a lot of different things for you. And uh, that's great. Everyone's going to use them because they're the, they're the first thing available and I can pick up one of them and use it for lots of different you know, use cases. Uh, I think over time, there's going to be spe- specialized models. Um, you know, If you just want to do language transformation, which we do, we convert text to a query language we don't need a you know multi-trillion parameter model to, to do that, and we can have much faster and cheaper, and uh, you know even fa- you know cheaper and faster are pretty much the same here, and so we can actually have better user experience and save ourselves money. So over time, I think you see specialization of particular niches um, or niches. I think is, is is it said in the US? Yeah, either of those uh, are acceptable. But, we'll, we'll accept both of those <laughs> as answers for niche uh, or niche. Uh, but, but, but the, uh, You're allowed to say both. Yeah. <laughs> But, but, but that's, that's I think that's yeah. the 
that's that's the correct answer is you know you, you right now the swiss army knife i love the way you put that i can go in there and ask it about travel or to write me a blog post or throw in some code and, and clean it up great great swiss army knife but if somebody makes a verticalized thing like you know the uh, you know github's copilot or stack overflow is working on one or somebody works on something just for finance or just for travel of course it's going to have a lot of features wrapped around it and a lot of verticalization and then reinforcement learning and it's going to blow away the general model that that's I, it, that should be pretty obvious i, I think it's pretty intuitive to think that's going to happen and th those are going to start showing up in the next year probably uh, especially with all the open source uh projects so you're uh in open source a lot of your success is based on open source so do you think the proprietary models like closed ai <laughs> previously known as open ai is pursuing what do you think is going to win the open ai model where it's closed uh or the actual open source models you know i guess uh facebook's lambda is uh open source and other ones that are coming out uh wh which one's gonna which one's gonna win the day i don't think that for us where we sit in the ecosystem it really matters if one or, or other people win the day because they're so um, interchangeable. Um, you know, for me, it's an API call to use a large language model. And so unlike saying, well, you know, how hard a choice was it to choose between Amazon or Azure or Google to host in the cloud, if I'm going to switch between one of those things and I've invested millions of dollars, you know, right into their APIs and working that way, like the switching costs are very high. The switching costs, you know, for large language models are, are very low. And we've at the moment partnered with OpenAI because they're the best. And we, you know, we've worked with them even on their contracts and how they store data and making sure they're much more, you know, B2B friendly. Uh, we think that we'll be probably using lots of models over time. And the real value is going to come from putting data together and having mm. those, uh, you know, data use cases. And this is where I think the landscape is going to change a lot because if you're a very small point player at the moment, you do one very, very specific thing for customers. I think you're going to be at a relative disadvantage compared to, you know, the larger players out there that do multiple things. Because if you do multiple things, you have lots of data across, uh, mm. you know, uh, the life cycle of that customer. And that can mean that your experiences can be way, way better uh, than they could be initially. And so I do think there's going to be a bit of a, the big get bigger in this next phase of uh, the internet. I'm not sure if that's good for, for everyone. I think it's great for Alassian. I don't know how good it is for, for society um but i do think that the you know the use of data is going to be the big uh big big win here it does seem that you, you could switch these out really easy i've been playing with it and uh you can very easily you know send your prompt engineering through one and then try it in the other look at the response teams i think there's going to be some meta layer here kind of like cdns or you know i guess some people with their cloud providers create um I've got, there's a there's a term of art for it where you can have your you know jobs in the cloud go to different providers you can go to aws for one thing go to another multi and have that we're done multi-cloud yeah so, so you can have like a multi-cloud thing i could see people having like multiple you know uh chat gpts and just go to the language model that you think is best for this current job uh, and meta's model obviously is llama google's is lambda founders always ask me for pitch deck punch-ups and how to present their startup in a better way. Well, I've got some great news. We worked with a team at Miro, the awesome whiteboarding software to create an amazing pitch deck template for founders. You can see it if you're watching the video right now, or uh, you can just go search for it. You go to Miro.com slash Miroverse and search for pitch deck. You'll find it immediately. And this uh, pitch deck will help you go from zero to VC ready. Our founder university participants, they love using this template. It starts them on second or third base. And if you're hybrid or fully remote, Miro is incredibly useful to you. It's like an old school in-person whiteboarding session, but distributed and asynchronous. So you can work on your time schedule. Miro lets you brainstorm ideas and collaborate on projects from anywhere in the world, whether you're in the Adirondacks or you're in Cabo or you're skiing in Lake Tahoe. When you think about Miro, think zero to one, but faster. And Miro is so much more than a simple digital whiteboard. Your team can collaborate on planning, research, design, and feedback cycles now remember faster inputs equals faster outcomes and velocity is how startup wins we look for product velocity in all of our startups so to access our new miroverse template and thousands of others sign up today for a free miro account at miro miro.com slash startups again miro.com slash startups miro.com slash startups yeah it does seem like they're already getting commodified uh in some way and then whoever has the data is going to win the day you have all this data on 
you know, that, I mean, that's another thing with a long tail of 260,000 customers, you've got a lot of data, and you can provide a lot of speed efficiency if people are trying to manage tasks or clear out bugs or whatever they're doing in the software that you provide, you're going to be finishing their sentences, huh? And being their co pilot, any of those products released yet? Have you put any in the wild or you're in the laboratory right now? Yeah, a couple of things. One is I think that from a B2B sense, like they'll be interchangeable. Um, we all know that consumer behavior is something that, you know, is harder to change. And so, you know, there might be a better search engine, but if I'm used to using Google every single day, am I going to try a vertical search engine for that one search to do something? Probably less likely. So I think there is, you know, and I think OpenAI has probably got the largest consumer uh, side of things. So I think it'll be, you know, from a B2B sense, yes, there'll be a lot of providers. I, I think it's still open how the consumer side will, will play out. Um, if I go back to Atlassian strengths, uh, you know, we have knowledge about how teams work and, uh, you know, how particularly around engineering teams and development teams. And so uh, we have information around, you know, what code gets written, what what customer problems happened, what bug reports happened. And uh, I, I keep challenging my teams to not just improve the way that our current customers do something, but really sit about the job to be done. And so take an example like customer support. Uh, no customer wants a faster customer support experience. They want to ha have not had to reach out to customer support in the first place. And, uh, you know, if you take it to the example of a, app you know on your phone it's like well why don't we send all the log files and all the errors from that app on your phone you know every single night like uh you know back to the developer and you know previously if there were minor errors in in products you just couldn't find the needle in the haystack and or fixing them would be too expensive but these days with you know the AI, with ai you can now see oh actually this little bug here i can even see the code that creates that bug and to fix that bug is a trivial you know change and so i can you know change the code and Maybe it's a human gets reviewed it. Maybe it's a different large language model that has a whole different training set reviews it. So you've got two different sets of eyes, you know, reviewing that code. And suddenly your code gets more robust and, you know, sent out based on, uh, you know, real life uh, data that comes out from the field. So instead of your customers having to file a bug report, they actually just never had to saw the bug in the first place. And I think that's yeah. what we're going to see over, you know, in the short term, we're seeing great party tricks like, hey, turn this list of, three things into a list of 15. That, that's great. It looks good. It's kind of cool. But the real yeah. value, I think, comes from totally reimagining, you know, customer experiences. How, how far away do you think those will be? Uh, we've had this parlor trick, like, incredible. It, it's it, helping me write the blog post. I make it shorter. I make it funnier. And hey, it got 60% done, 70% done. I polish it. Wow, this is crazy. I need to, I don't need to have a PR firm write a press release. Uh, the AI wrote it for me and I just polished it. So for a young startup, why hire some PR firm if I can just the CEO or the person running product can just, you know, become a bionic. So when do we see what you're talking about, which is, hey, we're going to intercept bugs, we're going to have multiple language models, review it. And, you know, it's sort of like precogs and minority report predicting what's going to go wrong and solving it in real time. That's trippy stuff. Is that five years out, 10 years out, two years out? I don't think that's five years out. I think that we're working on things like that at the moment. And, uh, to take a more knowledge worker example for you know the listeners of yours that aren't don't write code, uh, you know if you go away for a long weekend, you come back on a Tuesday and you're like, hey, I, I want to catch up. What did I miss? Mm. At the moment, that is a painful process because you go, well, what what do I need to read? What's important? What got actioned already that doesn't need my response? And because of the data we have on teams and teamwork, we can say, well. Jason, actually, your closest peers, you know, over on Monday, all collaborated on this document. By the way, here's at the end of the day, here's the change from X to Y. And I don't need to do that as a, a diff with red lines. I can actually explain the changes in human readable form for you. And I might be able to explain it in one sentence or two sentences. And if you want to get the three paragraph version, you just click. And if you want to see the actual red line changes, we can do that. And so the ability for a knowledge worker to catch up on work uh, is huge. And it's, if I look at at least my, my time, and I'm sure your time is like reading through or even just understanding what to read through is like a huge burden for most knowledge workers. And that's the stuff we're working on at the moment. Uh, that's absolutely brilliant. And I'm, I'm having this experience. We started recording every uh, meeting we have with founders for funding. Then we Zoom gives you the transcript. So you kind of get that for free. Then we put it into Notion. Notion's got AI built in. And we said, summarize it. And so now I get these little summaries. Hey, the investment team met with this person 
they talked to the founder about this, the founder said this, they're talking about a term sheet, there's a liquidation preference. I mean, it's scary how accurate it is. And, and it's saving me having to do that catch up. It's like having Jarvis in, in Iron Man or something, you walk up to the desktop, and it starts explaining to you, hey, here's what you missed. You know, Thor's in the other side of the galaxy solving this problem, Hulk's over here causing these problems. What do you want to do, Iron Man? And that is invaluable. That, that doesn't exist as a current product. And uh, I don't know why Slack doesn't do that right now. Slack's AI is just, is, is kind of MIA. Uh, it would be incredible to open up my Slack and just have it tell me, here's what's going on. Here's the changes that you missed. And so it's, that's, a, that's a great vision, um, I think, for time savings. What do you think and is going to happen? Because you're running a company. Okay, good. Yeah, no, respond. Well, it's just like, I think the thing with no. Slack is that the, if you think about the benefit, like at the moment, you're stringing multiple tools together. You're saying, okay, let me take, let me do a Zoom meeting. They get a Zoom transcript and throw it into, a, you know, Notion or Confluence and get Confluence to summarize it. And then I'll organize that in some way where I get to see the summaries in a certain, you know, way in a certain time. And I've got to work out my workflows. And for most people that... They can do that, but it's very complicated to make that happen. And same thing with Slack is that, you know, Slack has short form, you know, here's 10 words, here's 50 words. Like it's not paragraphs that need to get summarized. And for you to really understand a Slack conversation, you need to understand the context. Who is this person? What is their job? What have they been doing? What are they, what have they written in Confluence like, uh, you know, today? What, what have they been doing in their coding? And I think you actually mm. need to understand more data points across that ecosystem and, because of where we are at Alassian, because we can see the code and the stuff that the specs that they write and the, you know, and the, the jobs uh, that they had to get done in JIRA, like we have that data, we can provide all that. So eventually we can summarize it in a way that's like much more turnkey than you having to do it like a bit at a time. And so that's why I think someone like Slack might be able to do it. But if you had to pick out of the two, you'd say Microsoft Teams probably has a better starting point because they see more of the workflow that a, uh, a knowledge worker does. So that, that's, that's where I think, again, that, data gravity makes a big difference and, and we have a huge advantage there. And we didn't even talk about it suggesting what your next move is. So you come back to work and it's like, hey, <laughs> here's the three things that happened. By the way, you know, you have these three, the, this topic of this customer churning or threatening to churn. Here's ways in which we've saved customers before, whatever, you know, issue that you've suddenly been faced with. The AI could start giving you ideas of how to address that incoming issue. How efficient have you gotten internally? I know you guys did a small riff, maybe 5% of the company or something during the, the 2022 period, I guess, in the down market. Um, I think that's when it occurred. A lot of people did that. People did bigger ones, obviously, 10, 20%. And they, they didn't see, um, they, they saw things get more efficient. Obviously, if you cut the bottom couple of people, it's going to do that. Uh, that's just a performance metric there on any team. But today with AI in the enterprise, do you see yourself having to add a ton of people or just making the decision, hey, how do we point AI, AI at this problem? What What is your default as the leader of the company or the co-lead of the company? Yeah, let me, um, I'm bringing another trend here that's related because we, we're putting the two together. We're the largest company that's committed to remote work in the world. We have about 11,000 employees and no one is required to come to an office uh, any any day. You can work from home, you can work from the office, you can work from a cafe, uh, you can work from a trailer, you know, traveling around the United States if you wanted to. And, uh, you know, for a lot of times, you know, people's objections to that is that, well, how am I going to learn from that person sitting next to me at the desk? And, uh, you know, you talked about the sales call example that like, hey, we know how to save a customer or not. And, you know, one way to learn in a sales call is to, yeah, listen, you know, you know, I'm sitting next to the person at a desk when they do the sales call. But that's a very much a sort of whack-a-mole just happened to be, you know, um, at the right place at the right time to hear someone slightly better. If I look at using a company like Gong, which effectively records sales calls and uh, then, you know, does the transcription and then looks at competitive analysis and you can tag, hey, like this was the best saving of a sale customer from this particular competitor or this is the best pitch in this particular scenario or this vertical, I'm still into the healthcare space, like here's the, you know, the best person that pitched the healthcare space. I think we can end up with a, with a world where, you know, training and learning from other people is actually mediated by computers in ways that are way, way, way more effective than they ever could be by just happening to sit next to the, next to the person. And so um, we as a company have committed to remote work to build out a lot of those capabilities. Um, and we're kind of the canary in the coal mine about how we're building out those, uh, those experiences, whether it's 
whiteboards in our Confluence product, you know, and how do, how do you make a digital whiteboard experience better than kind of running into people or it's, you know, the summarization of data, like so that you can catch up on people uh, and what's happening that's not, you know, bumping into them at the water cooler. So we sort of put remote and AI together because we think that the combination of those two is really changing how knowledge workers interact. And so, you know, to back to your original question around, well, how are we doing this internally? We've got, you know, AI projects across the entire business. And we think, I think sales and customer touch will be heavily disrupted um, because I think there's a lot of busy work in many sales teams uh, job in terms of communicating with customers, but even just researching and understanding like what a customer is doing with our products. And we can surface that in incredible ways. And so take an example of a, you know, salesperson wants to, upsell someone, you know, to an, an enterprise version of the product, um, you know, they can see, well, you know, we have all this data about what our products get used for and how they get used. Of course, you know, not looking at the customer's, you know, private data, but just like, hey, which features get used. But previously, all that that stuff would have been too hard to look at on a feature-by-feature feature basis. But we can, using AI, summarize that down for, for people and say, well, actually, we think the enterprise features that we most appealing are X and Y and Z. Um, and and you can do it in real time, right? You could, be, you could be doing that in real time. That That's data that some team would work on, a team of data scientists for three or four weeks for some offsite meeting every other year. People would say this is amazing, then it would quickly be outdated. And it would be like institutional knowledge that, you know, just doesn't exist anymore. Now it's going to be real time, right? So these assistants are going to be telling you in real time while you're on the phone call. Yeah, you know, this this type of customer has gotten these features that work best. This customer is using two out of the three. So maybe this third one, we, they don't even know that. Maybe they need training on that one. Maybe they don't even know that product exists and we need to sell that into them. Do you worry about, I mean, uh, it's kind of a, a, you know, a very important question in some ways and a silly one in others. And I'm wondering where you sit on the sort of spectrum. Do you worry about this technology, which is moving faster than I, I think you would agree anything we've seen in our lifetime, maybe the spread of broadband, the spread of smartphones were also very fast. But this is faster, I think. This is going to have a tremendous displacement effect on certain jobs. So do you worry about that? Or do you think, yeah, you know, it's, it's overblown? It's a couple of things here. One is that, you know, the initial technologies, like I did a lot of research around how electricity uh, ran through and, and kind of changed the world in the 1800s. And uh, it's interesting, if you have ever gone to New York, you see, you go to Soho, you see these multi-floor uh, you know, warehouses basically that have often been turned into loft apartments. But uh, you walk down, you think, okay, this is the manufacturing district. And it looks nothing like how we do manufacturing these days. Mm. And it turns out that the way it worked was back then you had a steam engine that was in the middle of these uh, factories, often on the you know second or third floor. Um, and effectively the steam engine would drive belts and pulleys to effectively have all these machines and you would, you know, bring your products up to the floors because it was really almost a, a sphere because you want to be as close to that steam engine as possible because the belts and pulleys would, you know, effectively lose momentum and, you know, slack and they, you know, over time. So you had to be as close to the center as possible. And when electricity came in, what they did is, you know, those steam engines used to explode and kill people and other things. The the factories would replace that steam engine with an electric engine in the middle of the same factory in the same floor with the same belts and pulleys. Um, and now it was great. People didn't die, but the jobs didn't really change. Uh, you know, there's less someone throwing coal into a steam engine. But apart from that, if you were a, a worker on the floor, you didn't notice the difference. And so that was phase one. And that was basically, you know, sustaining what you currently did better. Uh, and then phase two came along where it's like, well, hang on, now that we have this thing called electricity, we don't need a central, like uh, one central blower effectively powering everything. We can have multiple smaller tools. And that's when you sort of saw the Henry Ford mm. production line. It's like, well, actually, let's move the product between the different tools as opposed to, you know, the reverse. And that's sort of the second stage is where you start re-tooling how, how things get made. And eventually, then the third phase, of course, you know, electricity being embedded in all the products, like, and... Uh, I guess you've probably seen that now with electric cars, but, you know, sort of you had various stages of that, you know, along the way. And uh, so that's what I think about AI is, you go, okay, phase one is going to be existing tools, existing products, existing processes, slowly augmented. We've still got, you know, the belts and pulleys to the same engine, but like it's a, it's a better way of doing things. And that's what we're seeing right now. 
And then over time, you say, okay, well, actually, you have to reimagine what that looks like. And, you know, that reimagining part, that does change the jobs that are available. Uh, it, that all the experience we've had in the past is that the jobs that are available, you know, exceed, uh, you know, the new ones exceed the previous ones. But there is a period of turmoil in between. That period of turmoil can last a decade as, you know, as things get jumbled up. When I look at yeah. the industries to be affected, I say, well, what's demand constrained and what's supply constrained? And in software, which what we sell to, to, you know, if we could have more software developers out there, we would. Like, they would get sucked up in the market immediately. I feel that that's a supply constrained environment. I think the open questions is, is in sales, is sales supply constrained or, or demand constrained? If my, my salespeople were twice as effective, would I hire more of them? Or would I hire less of them? And I think that is open in certain industries as to like when we can make them more effective, do we need more of them or less of them? Things like accountants and back office things are probably clearly in the, if they're mm. twice as effective, I just need half as many. Um, other areas of the business, it's not as clear. Uh, you know, it's so funny. I think as technologists of a certain age, we're constantly trying to, now that we have our, you, you, we both have like three decades of this and we watched the dot-com bust, we watched the Great Recession and we've watched multiple paradigms shift in our own lifetimes from mainframe computing, mini computing, desktop, client server, cloud. We've watched this so many times mobile that we even go back further and look for additional context. The one I use, you did electricity. I did, and I'll pull it up here because I think it's hilarious. While we were talking, I pulled up my chat GPT and I was like, hey, chat T, tell me about the history of ice shipping to homes before electricity. Because I had realized like this was yeah. the big craze. And when you were talking about, you know, uh, Soho where I grew up in New York and um, I was obsessed with that area and the warehouse. So I wound up living in a warehouse building on the west side of Manhattan on 26th and the West Side Highway, 13, 14 foot ceilings. And it was made to have, yeah. you know, like steam engines and all kinds of stuff. In it. There was a 95 year period, which here's the description of it from 1805 to basically 1900, where there was a massive amount of investment and entrepreneurship for a century around harvesting ice and bringing yeah. it to India, the Caribbean, all over the place, and coming up with new ways to systematically harvest it and ship it and maintain it. And there were a ton of people who would just drive around with horse and buggy in New York to bring ice to your refrigerator. You got it dropped off every day. And then boom, overnight, electricity. And then boom, the refrigeration unit. And this is one, of, but we didn't, we didn't have a permanent unemployed class after this happened, nor do we have a permanent unemployed class after, um, you know, phones went away and phone operators connecting calls went away. We found new uses for human ingenuity. That's what will happen here. Um, but I, the thing that I do find very interesting is every time I'm doing a new job rec now, I look at the job and I'm like, what are they going to do every day? What are the actual tasks? What are the goals? What could we automate? And I'm finding about 20 to 30% of each job could be automated away. So, and watching a portfolio of hundreds of companies, I'm seeing the same thing happen. You know, three or four person startups don't add the fourth or fifth position. They just, you know, they add the fourth, but they don't add the fifth and sixth. So the capital efficiency of these, you know, the, the most, um, uh, what's the word, you know, dexterous, the most uh, scrappy companies, they're looking to AI first. And then solving their problem with AI and then going on. I, I have a friend, uh, Brad Gerson, who was making, he wanted to make a video for a new project he's working on. He was working into script and then he took it and then he put it into, you know, Claude to make the script. And then he made this like generative AI video that looks like something, I guess he used 11 labs or something to make a marketing video. Now, this is something that a marketing agency would have spent, I don't know, 10 low tens of thousands or an individual contributor might have spent three or $4,000 building. But when I talked to him about it, I had encouraged him to just do it himself, write the script himself, and then he took it to the next step. The, the big learning is, well, if you take some people out of the process, it becomes more efficient. To your point about when uh, HipChat went from 10 to 25, it's actually more efficient if you can do the tools yourself. All these creative things, you know, you, you weren't allowed to, as a business executive, explore your creative chops. You had to go to a video editor, a designer, a logo person. And now you got the founders of companies. I watch them. I'm like, oh, it's a beautiful logo. How did you make it? They're like, AI. I'm like, you made your logo with AI. They're like, yeah. And then I remember five or 10 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, people were using like, you know, they would use Fiverr or something. They'd make their logo for 500 bucks. 
10 years before that when you were you know doing at lassen in the you know 2001 to 2010 period what did a logo cost you pay a design firm three five ten grand to do a logo study what did you pay for your first logo do you remember i think you we actually a profession? Call, if you look at the history of our logos i think it's pretty clear that we made them ourselves but uh <laughs> but that would have been made a lot better i think uh yeah. you know, if we'd had all the ai back then and i think it's the, the, the creative class i think that when you know, people ask me what advice do I give to kids about, you know, where to spend your efforts and, you know, what should you learn? And clearly the accumulation of knowledge is not something that is going to win anymore. Like the person that knows the most in the room, you know, is going to be beaten by Wikipedia every day of the week. Uh, but, of course, the accumulation of knowledge builds you the skill set of, you know, learning and like learning quickly and learning how to, uh, you know, think differently. And so I do think there's a benefit of still Acquiring knowledge, not for knowledge's sake, but for getting great at, you know, at, at learning. And uh, so then it comes down to, well, it's, can you bring multiple different disciplines together, which is sort of creativity? Like, can you create some new idea or something new to the world? Um, and that's the interesting part. And so I do think there should be a renaissance in, you know, the um, way we teach kids like, to be less about right learning and more about well, what, what are the ideas that haven't been thought up yet. Uh, mm. Again, I don't know if there's any traditional schools in the US. There aren't as many in Australia that, uh, that that teach that way. Yeah, we definitely need to rethink education because if you can just sit there with one of these guides, like you said, you know, pulling up the Wikipedia page, just kind of great equalizer, wrote learning. You really need creativity, drive, grit, resiliency, teamwork, leadership, you know, all of those skills, which, you know, it's very hard to teach those things uh, become, I think, really defining. Listen, you give me a bunch of time. I just want to ask you, one or two more questions, which is, how do you stay motivated in decade three of your startup? A lot a lot of folks, you got Jeff Bezos is on a boat somewhere. He, he's like done. I think he's going to come back. I think he's going to get bored. Uh, you saw Bob Iger retired. He told he uh, he told uh, CNBC, he's like, you know, I, I was on a boat for like six months. I lost my mind. I had to come back. You think about retiring. You think about other projects. You think about philanthropy. I know you've done some great philanthropy work. Investing, you, you backed a lot of the, like I think uh, you LP'd a lot of the Australian uh, funds, from what I understand, did a bunch of angel investing and stuff like that. Y you ever think of life beyond Atlassian and how do you stay motivated in the third decade at the same company? Yeah, I do want to plug uh, the philanthropy side of things before I answer your question. Please, um, yeah, open it up. Yeah. I, uh, I started a, a, about uh, a decade ago, well, actually almost two decades ago, we committed ourselves to the sort of one 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 model, which Salesforce did as well, which is we give Atlassian 1% of our equity, 1% of our profit, 1% of our product, 1% of our employee time uh, away. And we did that for a long time. And it's been great for us. Uh, employees love it. They joined for it. It's been a huge boon for us. And uh, about a decade ago, I looked around and realized we were still one of the few companies doing this. And so I started a foundation called Pledge 1%. And the aim was to convince every company to do that same model. And uh, in that decade uh, since, uh, we've got about 17,000 companies now have pledged to give 1% uh, you know, of product employee time, product or profit uh, away. And so like we're really starting this corporate philanthropy movement. So I just encourage many of your listeners are you know, a startup. So I just encourage you to, to check that out because uh, no matter what stage you're at, it could just be the first day of your business. It could be you've been running for 10 years. Um, you know, a pledge is a very easy thing to do because it doesn't take time until you've actually got something to give back. And so uh, quite proud about that. Um, on, on your original question number. around. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. a, but it's a big number for Atlassian, right? Like 1% of, a, of a, Atlassian is a lot of equity and 1% of 10,000 people's time or so at 20, that's 20 hours each. Well, that's a lot of hours. You're talking about 200,000 hours. Yeah, we've, given away, uh, about, we've given away about 200 and something thousand hours. Uh, we've given away a hundred and something thousand um, licenses, either free or discounted to communities or nonprofits. And, uh, you know, we've given away, I don't know, 50 or hundred million dollars like to, to charities over that time. Obviously, it's still corpus of money to give away. So, be huge for us, but I think it's eclipsed by what Pledge 1%, you know, can do if you, um, there's many companies yeah. out there from, you know, Twilio to Page of Duty that have, you know, taken the pledge. So, it's great. Anyway, if you're a startup out there, uh, check it out. Yeah, pledge do it. Org. Go to Pledge 1%, um, yeah. On the on the next side of things, uh, what's next? Uh, I I still get inspired by a mission, which is to unleash the potential of every team. And the sort of Archimedes said, uh, "Give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to move it, and I'll I'll move the world." And uh, you know, the idea is leverage. How, how do you like improve things with a lot of leverage? 
And if you look at our products, they get used by everyone from SpaceX to the American Red Cross to the Australian Antarctic Division. And if we can make every team, you know, 50%, 100% more effective, if we, you know, that is going to change the world more than anything else I could do individually. Like I could go, you know, start a space company or start, you know, any sort of like, you know, huge entrepreneurial venture out there that's made a difference. But the compound effect of helping 250,000 companies and tens of millions of people to be more productive and like enjoy their jobs more and get get more done for the world, like that's way bigger impact that I could have in almost any other uh, domain. And so like that, that keeps me excited at the mission level. And, and then as an entrepreneur, you know, we're 11,000 people. Uh, two decades ago, we were two people. So every single year, there's a different challenge and a different journey to go on. And uh, that intellect is, is hugely intellectually stimulating uh, for me. I love, I love learning. I love trying new things. I love, uh, uh, I don't like failing as much, but like that's part of the process. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, it keeps sucks, me stimulated right? every day. But it's really interesting to think about what it's like to manage 11,000 people. I mean, you, meet, you must, pe- must, must meet people. You're walking around on the weekend with your kids. You must meet people who work for you who you, don't, you never met. It's got to be surreal. You do, yeah. When people are wearing a Lassian shirt, uh, you know, is uh, around the streets or, um, you know, getting a selfie with your staff is a, is a new one for me relatively recently in the last couple of years. And uh, again, it's just a realization that, um, you know, across 11,000 people, you can't have a one-to-one relationship with, with all of them, but uh, you can inspire them. Um, in fact, one of my maxims is that uh, the most important thing about leadership is uh, to set a vision. People, people work for a complete asshole who has a great vision. Uh, they won't work for the nicest person in the world that has no direction. And so my, my number one thing for, le- for leadership is, is vision. And so I'm hoping across 11,000 people, we can mm-hmm. still set a pretty compelling vision, even if I can't have that one-to-one relationship. Yeah, fantastic. Listen, Scott, thanks for taking so much time for the This Week in Startups audience. Amazing journey. Keep at it. And uh, I'll be back in Australia. I think next year we're going to do the Launch Festival again. So hopefully I'll see you down. They are in either Sydney or Melbourne, one of those cities. That'd be great. Yeah, congrats on everything. And we'll see you next time on This Week in Service. Bye-bye.